Uh, welcome everyone to this evening's uh, session on trade union and working class history. My name is Gawain Little. I'm the General Secretary of the General Federation of Trade Unions and I'm really, really pleased to welcome you to the second in our series, part of a wide range of um, courses that the uh, GFTU offers. Um, I'm really, really pleased uh, to have with us today um, John Rees, uh, author, writer, activist, author of The Leveller Revolution, who's going to be speaking us to, to us today about the levellers and the English Revolution. We've uh, always said in these sessions that it is really, really important for us to understand uh, our history if we're to enable ourselves to act in the present and to build the future. And I think the history of the levelers is a really, really important part of our tradition, the tradition of our movement. Uh, John is an expert on a subject and really, really pleased to have him speaking to us this evening. I'm going to hand over to John in a moment, who will be presenting. And then after that, we'll take questions and discussion. We will be finished by 8.30 this evening, but hopefully that will leave plenty of time for a good, good discussion amongst the people who are here. If you're joining us on Facebook, uh, please do feel free to post comments in the chat and we'll try to respond to them here as well. Uh, but without further ado, I'll hand over to John. So John, you're really, really welcome. And uh, the floor is yours. Wayne, thanks very much. And, uh, and thanks for the invitation to, um, to speak to you tonight. Um, so, on the 30th of January, 1649, the English people did something uh, absolutely without precedent. Uh, having put their king on a public trial, uh, they found him guilty of treason and on a platform erected outside the banqueting house, um, same building uh, that uh, is still there or in Whitehall, um, they executed him by chopping off his head. Um, that was unique. Of course, monarchs had uh, been murdered before by members of their own family, uh, had lost their lives on the battlefield, had been um, killed by rivals, but there had never been a moment when they'd been put on trial for treason in a public trial. In fact, the whole idea of treason uh, was only something which a subject could do against a monarch. It was inconceivable that a monarch could do it against the citizens of his own country. It was not, as one of the people who signed the death warrant, the regicides, uh, Colonel Thomas Harrison said, it was not a thing done in a corner. In fact, uh, the new Secretary for Foreign Tongues, that is the Foreign Secretary in the New Republic, John Milton, the greatest poet of his age, perhaps the greatest poet of any age, uh, wrote the first and second defences of the people of England so that all Europe would know why the English had executed their king. On that day, uh, on the scaffold in Whitehall, um, there were uh, three men uh, from a movement called the Levellers. Uh, Richard Rumbold was one of them, and he was later executed in Scotland uh, for his part in a plot in the 1660s. And on his own scaffold, he said these words, no man is born with a saddle on his back and no man booted and spurred to ride him. He'd actually learnt those words uh, from a paper edited by another man on the scaffold that day, who edited a paper called Mercurius Militaris, or the Army Scout, and that was a leveller paper directed at the rank and file of the new model army. The third man on the uh, platform was uh, Robert Lockyer, who at the King's trial had spat in the King's face and shouted justice, justice from the crowd. So I want to look at who these remarkable group of people uh, were and where they came from. So here's some information about the origin of the Leveller movement. Um, they were, most of them, uh, London apprentices. Um, that is, that they were apprenticed to a master craftsman 
to uh, learn their trade. That took five or seven years uh, living in the master's house. And after uh, you completed your apprenticeship, you could become a free man of one of the guilds, the corporations of London, the coppersmiths or the merchant venturers or the haberdashers or whatever your trade was. Um, the apprentices in London were um, the largest group of young people in any kind of further education until higher education was opened up in this country in the 1950s. Uh, they were famously uh, boisterous, not necessarily or always politically, although sometimes that, um, uh, but feast days and holidays um, not infrequently saw the apprentices riot in one way or another. Um, nearly all uh, the levellers were radicals in religion. And I want to say a little bit about the Church of England. So any ideas that you've got about the Church of England now, just, I mean, in this day and age, just cast those aside because the Church of England in the 17th century was something entirely uh, different. It was performing the functions that in a modern society are performed not just by the church, but by the civil service, by the press, by the courts, the churches had their own courts. It was compulsory uh, that you were a member of the Church of England. If you didn't attend your parish church, you could be fined or ultimately imprisoned. And it was compulsory that you had your child baptized into the Church of England. So people who rejected that hierarchy, um, like the levellers, who thought that you could be in a so-called gathered church where the congregants chose their own way of worship, that was a blow not just against the theology of the day, but against the politics and a key political structure of the day. And nearly all the uh, levellers were radicals of that kind in religion. You can see a pamphlet there uh, directed against them by the so-called water poet John Taylor, who was a, a waterman on the Thames River. He was an ardent royalist, and he hated what he called, as you see there, sectaries and schismatics, i.e. people who were breaking away uh, from the Church of England. He hated um, so-called tub preachers. You can see there at the famous Nags Head um, Tavern in the corner there, you can see the Nags Head on the pub billboard. Um, uh, that was a, a, a pub just down um, near uh, the Bank of England, where the Bank of England now is. Um, and Samuel Howe uh, was a tub preacher. He gathered together a congregation which included women um, and allowed women to speak, unusual in that day and age. And John Taylor hated them. He thought they were, as it says there, cobblers, tinkers, peddlers, weavers, sow gelders, and chimney sweeps, i.e., uh, the lower class and uh, people who really didn't ought to have a say in how religion was ordered. Um, the Levellers were also involved in illegal printing. Um, they brought in pamphlets from Holland, where the presses were freer in Amsterdam, and imported them and sold them uh, in uh, England. This was in the, 16, uh, in the 1630s. Um, London at that time was a densely packed and fast growing city, um, something like uh, a third of a million within the old medieval walled city and about the same kind of number in the Tower Hamlets, as they were called, to the east of the Tower of London and across the only bridge across the Thames, London Bridge in uh, Southwark. Uh, this is a rather marvelous, uh, uh, no, that, not that, um, this is a rather marvellous piece of work. Um, it was done by students at De Montfort, uh, University in Leicester using gaming technology and it recreates from architectural plans and ground plans um, what the streets of London looked like in those days. You'll see they were so densely packed that I've called it the internet of the alleyways because news travel enormously quickly from one overhanging balcony to another, from one alley uh, to another. Of course, the, uh, practically every corner had not only a pub, but a church. Um, the parish churches of London, some of them taken over by radical preachers, were places where you could learn the political gossip of the day, as well as engage in theological argument. So uh, 
this is probably as close as you're ever going to get to seeing what London looked like in the in the sixteen in the sixteen forties. Uh, um, it's only a short film, uh, but I, I won't let it all play out here. Uh, you can find this uh, online if you search in Google for Flight of London. You'll probably uh, come across uh, across this. So uh, this is the signatory. This is the sig uh, the uh, the autograph of the best known uh, of the Levellers, uh, John Lilburn, uh, as you can see, written on the eleventh day of June, uh, sixteen forty six. That rather flamboyant signature isn't the only significant thing on this document, though. If you see that red piece of wax there, um, that's got his family seal on it from his uh, his signet ring. What that tells us is that uh, John Lilburn came from a well-off gentry uh, family. Um, the, the, the Levellers weren't the poorest of the poor. They were what contemporaries called uh, the middling sort. Um, second son, John Lilburn, a second son, couldn't expect to inherit from his father and so was uh, apprenticed into trade with Thomas Hewison in London Stone, Cannon Street in in modern London, in modern London, to learn the trade of a of a cloth uh, a cloth seller, but he was also mixing um, with exactly the kind of radical religious thinkers that I was mentioning just now. In fact, he was engaged in bringing uh, illegal pamphlets um, into London. He was betrayed by one of his co-workers, arrested and taken before the Star Chamber. Now, the Star Chamber was a royal court, a so-called prerogative court, because it sat at the prerogative of the monarch. There was no jury, and the main way of getting a defendant uh, to be found guilty was by a coerced confession. Lilburn refused to testify to the Star Chamber. He said that no freeborn Englishman should be forced to testify against himself. And from that moment on, he was known to the London crowd as freeborn John Lilburn or honest John Lilburn. Uh, for his defiance, he was taken from the Fleet Prison, now where the eastern end of Fleet Street is in London, tied to the back of a cart, or as he put it, to the arse end of a cart, dragged all the way to uh, Whitehall, uh, and he was whipped every step of the way with a three-thonged leather knotted whip until, as one contemporary said, his shoulders were swollen to the size of penny loaves. When they got into Whitehall, they stuck him in the, uh, in the stocks. He was still throwing the pamphlets that he'd illegally imported from his coat pocket to the crowd and trying to make speeches until his jailer uh, gagged him, whereupon he decided that the best form of protest was to stamp his feet for the remaining one and a half hours that he was in the stocks. He was then taken back uh, to uh, prison, and he was only free when the Long Parliament met in 1640 um, after a speech by a then little known MP called Oliver Cromwell, uh, the MP for Huntingdon. One of Lilburn's great skills was to dramatize his own suffering, uh, and this is a pamphlet produced in 1641. You can see down at the bottom there of that printed page, printed for William Larner. William Larner was a leveller printer all the way through the 1640s and into the 1650s. And here he is uh, producing the Christian man's trial, uh, John Lilburn's own account of his suffering at the hands of the Star Chamber, um, with this George Glover engraving of the young John Lilburn, probably in his early 20s at this, at this uh, time. He wasn't the only one, though. Uh, he was working with a whole bunch of associates. Lilburn, we just talked about, the printer, uh, William Larner. Also, Catherine Chidley and her son, to become the treasurer of the Levellers, Samuel Chidley. Catherine Chidley was a remarkable woman in an age where women weren't supposed to preach and weren't supposed to write. Uh, she did both. She attacked one of the leading conservative theologians of the time, Thomas Edwards, in print. Uh, he was so stunned that he'd been attacked by a, a woman 
uh, writing a pamphlet, but he couldn't bring himself to reply to her until two years later, she did it again, and then he was forced uh, to do so. Um, Richard Overton was also an underground printer, a pamphlet writer, a magnificent prose stylist, a reputative uh, uh, enemy of the Royalists and of the House of Lords and of the King. He adopted the name, the pseudonym Martin Marprelate, um, and wrote a series of almost play-like uh, pamphlets parodying church and state. Some of them were so popular they were turned into ballads and sung in the street. Nicholas Tew was his associate in running the secret press. Thomas Lamb was a Baptist preacher who used his congregation as a way of spreading leveler ideas. William Walwyn, pictured here, um, was uh, older than most of the levelers. He was a, a merchant adventurer, one of the richest corporations in London and a substantial uh, merchant in his own right, and a very fine prose stylist, whereas um, you could expect fireworks from a John Lilburn pamphlet. You could expect roustabout about humor from a Richard Overton pamphlet, but from a William Walwyn pamphlet, you got clear, cool logic. Um, the guy in the middle there is Henry Martin, the only MP to side with the Levellers, born in Oxford. There's the plaque on his house uh, still standing in Oxford. He was uh, a famously effective speaker in the House of Commons and probably the wittiest man in uh, the, the Commons. Um, he was taking a cat nap uh, on the benches of the Commons one day, or at least he appeared to be. One of his enemies um, stood up and moved that the nodders be put out, that is, that people falling asleep should be thrown out of the Commons. But uh, Martin wasn't quite as asleep as he appeared to be, and he got up and moved an amendment saying that the noddies the boars that put them to sleep should be chucked out of the commons. When the House of Lords was abolished after the execution of the king, the motion that abolished it read that it was useless and dangerous. Martin moved an amendment which said it was useless, but not really that dangerous, which might be true today, but wasn't really true then. So there are some of those, some of the leading figures among uh, the levellers. In the first civil war, there were divisions among the parliamentarians and revolutions are won not just by the clash between the counter-revolutionaries and the revolutionaries, um, but uh, the determining policy, the clashes within the revolutionary side. So from the very first, there was a peace party which really thought that the war with the king was simply a kind of armed negotiation. You've got to remember that it was inconceivable that the king should be overthrown. So Parliament went into battle, literally, the battle flags read for King and Parliament. So they were trying to say they were the people that were trying to rest the, rescue the King from his um, evil advisors, uh, that it wasn't the King's fault and that they wanted a peace as quickly as possible. The War Party, of which Martin and Levellers were members, said, no, no, uh, we need to fight the war to the finish. It's only if we decisively defeat the King that we can expect anything like a proper settlement. The Scottish Presbyterians uh, fought on the side of uh, the English Parliament, but became increasingly um, conservative, increasingly interested in restoring uh, the, the monarchy, as long as the monarchy agreed to a Scottish form of church in England, a kirk in England. Um, that produced a further division between independents that was the name given to Oliver Cromwell and his associates because they believed that congregations should be independent within the Church of England and not subject to the hierarchy of bishops and archbishops. And all the radicals, Cromwell and Lilburn, associated closely at this time in the war party and against the Presbyterians. This wasn't a popular stand. Uh, Lilburn found himself back in jail, jailed this time by the House of Lords in 1646 for advocating a radical settlement of the nation after the first civil war. This is Richard Overton's pamphlet in his defense. Um, we've all heard of photo montage. Well, this is engravo montage, I guess. Um, it's taken the George Glover portrait from 1641 that we saw on the uh, Lana pamphlet 
and over the top of it, Overton has engraved the prison bars behind which Milburn was being held in the Tower of London. And in typically sarcastic Overton style, the legend across the top reads, the liberty of the freeborn Englishman, conferred on him by the House of Lords, June 1646. Now to the London crowd and to soldiers in the New Model Army who received this pamphlet, the meaning of this image would have been crystal clear. What it was saying is, you remember freeborn John Lilburn, the victim of Charles I, the victim of the Court of Star Chamber. Now, even though we've won a war against the King, the House of Lords has put him back in prison. What has gone wrong with the revolution that John Lilburn, the hero of the London crowd, is back in prison? That would have been an unmistakable message just looking at the image, never mind about the text of this uh, of this pamphlet. And um, that very soon coincided with a huge revolt in the New Model Army, the army which had won the Civil War against Charles I. The Conservatives and the Scottish Presbyterians, uh, the moderates in the House of Commons who wanted to re-enthrone the King, attempted to disband the New Model Army or send its regiments uh, to Ireland, where they would be safely out of the way, trying to put down the Irish rebellion. That triggered a wholesale revolt right across the army. It was a kind of revolution within the revolution. And here's the pamphlets which uh, were produced in that revolt, because the revolt took a very particular form. In regiment after regiment, first in the cavalry, then in the infantry, the ordinary soldiers elected their own representatives. They were called agitators, and the word didn't have its modern meaning, it simply meant representative. Um, but suddenly the army was under the control of its own elected representatives, and they had a printing press run by a man called Edward Sexby, uh, who was also a sympath sympathizer of the levelers, and it produced these pamphlets. The case of the army truly stated, the proposals of the agitators in the army. And these spread the case of the rank and file of the army, very similar in many ways to the, uh, to the case being put by the levelers. In order to make sure that the king couldn't be put back on the throne by the moderates and the Scottish Presbyterians, Cornick Joyce led 500 troopers and seized the king and took him to the army, seized him at Holmby House. And um, when asked by Charles I, where is your commission? This is a, a Cornet, Cornet Joyce, lowest rank in the army. Where is your commission? And what Charles means is, by what lawful authority are you taking me prisoner? And uh, Joyce says first to him, well, you know, we think that if you're free, there'll be another war and we can't, we can't stomach another war. And Charles says to him again, where is your commission? And in the end, Joyce turns round and points to the 500 troopers behind him, people who've elected him, and says, these are my commission. And Charles, to be fair to him, said, it's as fine a commission as I've ever seen. That transformed uh, the revolution. The army was now a power in the land. The agitators were a power in the army. And at Putney, uh, Putney Church in 1647, they met to discuss what the future of the society would be? What would be the new constitution of the society? It was a debate in which ordinary soldiers debated with the leaders, Sir Thomas Fairfax and Lieutenant General Oliver Cromwell, the highest commanders in the army, all debating together about the fate of the king and the constitutional settlement of the, na of the nation. We've got this debate, comes down verbatim because William Clark, um, who was a clerk in the army, took it all down. He took it all down in shorthand. The Puritans of the 17th century invented shorthand because they wanted to take down um, preachers' remarks in sermons and discuss them later. And in order to do that, they uh, invented forms of shorthand. William Clark had that shorthand, uh, took down the debates, later translated some of them into longhand. When the monarchy was rest restored in 1660, he thought it wasn't safe to have them, gave them to his brother. His brother put them in Worcester College, Oxford, where they stayed for 250 years 
until they were discovered by the Victorian historian C.H. Firth. Those of them still in shorthand, this wouldn't have been Pittman or any standard shorthand, were given to Bletchley, Co Bletchley Park codebreakers to find out what they were actually saying. So this is the first written constitution ever in this country. It's called the Agreement of the People. This is John Wildman, the leveller that proposed it at Putney. It called for freedom of the press, freedom of religion. Uh, it called for um, a electorate, male universal uh, suffrage to elect a new parliament. Utterly radical and revolutionary ideas in 1647. Um, besides John Wildman, the other main leveller spokesman at Putney was Colonel Thomas Rainsborough, probably the most famous soldier in England at the time after Oliver Cromwell. There's his signature, there's a portrait of him. And uh, he said at Putney that he thought that the poorest he that is in England was entitled to a voice as the richest he, and that no man should put himself under a government that he had not first had a hand in creating. He was opposed by Cromwell, who said this will lead to anarchy, and by Cromwell's son-in-law, Commissary General Henry Arton, who in opposing Rainsborough said, all that I say is because I have an eye to property. In other words, if we give the property list the vote, they will use the vote to take away the property of the rich. Now, that was a very plausible idea in 1640. They hadn't had um, centuries of parliamentary government to teach them that people can have the vote and the rich can hang on to their property perfectly easily. Uh, but it was a, so it was a much more radical proposal then than now. What ended the Putney debates was that the king escaped and that the levellers were put down in a mutiny at Corkbrush uh, Field. Um, Thomas Fairfax and Oliver Cromwell had promised that the agreement of the people would be decided by a general rendezvous of the whole army. Um, they sent the levellers and the agitators back to their regiments. In fact, they called three separate rendezvous so that uh, the full force of the leveller case couldn't be put at one meeting. And they uh, went into the crowd. Cromwell rode into the crowd of soldiers, pulling the agreement of, people, of the people from the hats of the soldiers where they'd put them to show their support. One of the mutineers, Richard Arnold, was shot by two of his fellows after they'd uh, chosen by Lot, who was to be killed and who to survive. So this was a moment when the levellers were on the defensive, but it didn't last long. The king's escape led to a second civil war, and in that, the levellers were at the height of their power. They had uh, not only the paper I've already mentioned, Mercurius Militaris, aimed at the new model army, but also this paper, the moderate. Now, it was a joke at the time, and it's been a joke ever since, that that was a rather poor choice of name for the leveller paper. In fact, you can go into the archives in the British Library and find one of the old copies of the moderate where one reader has put a little arrow uh, between the word the and the word moderate and inserted the letters I-M so that it reads the immoderate and then another little arrow at the end of the word moderate and inserted the word rogue so that the title now reads the immoderate rogue and perhaps that was closer to the content than the actual title. Anyway this paper ap appeared weekly and propagated leveller views at a meeting in Well Yard in Wapping. Uh, Lilburn was organizing his supporters. Um, a police spy uh, grasped him up to the House of Lords and he was jailed again. Um, they launched a large petition which had 40,000 signatures. This is in a population, by the way, of the entire country that was about 5 million. So I don't know what that would work out in these days, but many millions on that signature in modern terms. Um, and they managed to mobilize a huge revolutionary block against the Conservatives in Parliament and the Presbyterians in uh, Scotland. Um, Thomas Rainsborough, who we've seen at, at, um, at Putney as the leveller spokesman, um, he was killed by a, law, a royalist raiding party in the last siege 
of the Civil War. At his funeral, which started in Tottenham, came down the Kingsland Road in Hackney, round the Tower of London and out to his burial place in St John's Church in Wapping, was a huge leveller uh, show of force. Um, the sea green ribbon that became the, the party signature of the levellers, perhaps after Rainsborough's um, colour, his regiment's colour of sea green. Um, and that broke that huge demonstration and the the uh, the petition, the large petition, reproduced in regiment after regiment and county after county, um, pushed the parliamentarians on to purge the moderates from parliament. Colonel Thomas Pride went down to parliament, chucked out the moderates by standing at the door of the House of Commons and refusing to let them go in. And then the parliament voted to set up the High Court to try Charles I and to execute him. Here's William Rainsborough, that's Thomas Rainsborough's brother. Um, you can see there what he thought of the king. Um, but the more interesting thing is not the, the uh, bloody image of the king's decapitated head, but the Latin tag, uh, Salus Populi Supremus Lex, the safety of the people is the highest law. And that was the catchphrase, that was the slogan, if you like, of the parliamentarians, that nobody was above the law, that the safety of the people was the highest law, that Charles I was a danger to the safety of the people and therefore should be put on trial for treason. And he was so uh, put on trial, found guilty. There's a contemporary engraving of the platform outside the banqueting house. Um, with Charles I being executed. Those of you with good eyesight can see the rather dramatic spurts of blood issuing uh, from his neck on the, uh, on the platform. The execution of the king uh, produced a fracturing of the revolutionary bloc. The Levellers and Cromwell, so closely allied in the final days of the English Revolution, um, departed from each other over the question of whether or not the Republic should be a military Republic resting on the uh, ranks of the new model army, or whether there should be a new election and a new House of Commons. You can see what Lilburn thought about this from the title of his pamphlet, England's New Chains Discovered, or in his view, meet the new boss, the same as the old boss. The Levellers were arrested, uh, their women supporters petitioned on their behalf, regiments in the army at Bishopsgate, at Burford and in Oxford, mutinied in uh, their defence, but were put down by Cromwell. Lilburn was tried, tried for his life. The jury acquitted him, much to the astoundment, astoundment of the authorities, but he had to go into exile. And from that moment on, really, in 1649, the levellers ceased to be an organised political force. One of the remarkable things I said is that uh, women's organization in the in the levelers, Catherine Childley was the person that produced that petition for um for Lilburn, but his own wife, Elizabeth Lilburn, and uh, Mary Overton were substantial activists in their own rights. This was an astounding thing, of course, to contemporaries. Here we have two pamphlets. Um, the Parliament of Ladies with their laws newly enacted. That's a parody. Um there were many of them, uh, of women political activists, but the other pamphlet, the humble petition of diverse, well-affected women, well-affected uh, was a phrase that meant in the English Revolution pretty much the same as citizen meant in the French Revolution. It referred to the supporters of Parliament. And that's the genuine article. That's um, the petition that Catherine Chidley and her supporters um, took to the House of Commons in defence of Lilburn. The MPs that came out said... Um, that it was very unusual, very unusual that women should petition. And Catherine Chidley replied, well, it's very unusual that you should have cut off the king's head, but no doubt you'll justify it. Um, of course, in England, unlike in America or France, where the American Revolution and the French Revolution are taught in schools and part of the national heritage, the restoration meant that the lessons of the English Revolution travel by more underground passages in popular works of art, in radical historians, in the labour movement, in the annual Leveller's Day celebration. This is 
not that. Um, this is um, the Reverend Hammer's Bonnie Bessies. Um, it's about the arrest of Milburn and the women's um, position on their behalf. It's very historically accurate, the lyric actually. Um, it's part of the Freeborn Don album, which he made about the whole history of the Reverend here. They dragged on John to the tower. Once more I treat him was the gibbon. They dragged on John to the tower. With Thomas Prince and Richard Orbart. They dragged on his John to the town. And the women of the city rose up in disgust and pity when they dragged on his John to the tower. And the streets through this whole So that um, that chorus there, and that indeed was what the women were called, the Bonnie Besses in the sea green dresses. Bonnie Besses, I guess, uh, as a gesture towards uh, John Lilburn's uh, Geordie heritage and the sea green dresses were, in May, were indeed made for women who supported the levellers at the time. So that's one underground method of learning about the levellers. Here's another by my old friend, Red Saunders. It's a tableau vivant, as he calls them. Looks like an oil painting, actually is a photograph of people dressed in and uh, and debating the issues of uh, the levelers. So um, that's about it. Thank you so much, John. Um, ab so much in there. Um, it it's, uh, was absolutely, absolutely fascinating. Um, and I imagine people are are still just uh, just absorbing some of that. And the image you've ended on there um, by Red Saunders um, is is one of a number of images created that we've actually got displayed in uh, Corngrange Hotel, where the GFTU, uh, where we ha have our training centre and run our courses. Um, with a number of those, and, and this is one of those that's up there. Um, I, just fascinating to have that kind of um, depth of detail about the levels. I suspect many of us will 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 have known some of it in outline. But um, I'll open in a minute to to questions from uh, those in the meeting. So please do have a think uh, if you've got something that you'd like to ask John or a point you'd like to make on. The talk that he's just given then to pop your electronic hand up or or put comments into the chat but just while people are thinking of questions to ask her, something really struck me that you said part way through john and it was just just a small comment but about the um for the levelers some of the demands they made and 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 some of the actions that took place at that time will seem incredibly radical i mean you know they, they beheaded a monarch um, but at the same time, some of the demands these days may seem much less radical. That, for example, of, uh, of universal suffrage. In fact, you know, we've obviously gone much further than, than the core demand of, of universal male suffrage put up by many of them. Um, and yet at the time, and it really struck me at the time, because they hadn't had the long experience that we've had of both the strengths, but also the weaknesses of parliamentary democracy. The idea that to, to the rich at the time, giving ordinary people the vote seemed unthinkable because what would happen is they would clearly use that to democratize society, to share out property rights, to equalize all of us. And of course, looking back from our perspective now, uh, much of that hasn't happened in spite of universal suffrage. We saw massive inequality in society, massive divisions between rich and poor. Um, 
And I, I'm not sure if there's a question in there, but it, it's something that really, really struck me about demands that actually seemed radical in their time and some of their implications would be deeply radical today, but somehow the path our democracy has taken has been um, less fulsome than that, more narrow and more limited, more precarious, I guess. I don't know if you had any comment on that. And then uh, let's see if there are any other questions in the room after that, but. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, I guess there's two registers to this really. Of course, the demand for the vote is still a radical demand in very large par parts of the world. I mean, it's in Sisi's Egypt, that demand will get you in jail, just as it did John Lilburn. And I think you're right to say that democratic rights are always precarious. They can always be taken away. And, you know, we only have to look at what fascism did in Europe in the last century to see that the wheel can roll back as well as forward. So it, it's always, it, it should always be, in my view, um, it can't be the total extent by a considerable distance of what a modern left has to say, but it should always be a constituent part of it. Mm. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so thoughts, comments, questions from participants, um, raise your ele electronic hands if you'd like to come in and uh, we'll unmute you and give you an opportunity to maybe ask a question or maybe make a comment on some of what John's talked about and how that relates to what we face today. Shall I, um, there's a message, there's a meeting, there's a question in the chat. Oh, that I've missed. Yeah, no, absolutely. My apologies. Have you, have you, um, do you want to read it out? I uh, can't see it in the chat here. Is it only come I'll to you, John? Or? Yeah. Oh, maybe, uh, it's from Joe here. It said, um, I want you to read this out because it's a bit embarrassing me reading it out. But it says, um, having read your amazing book about the levellers, I found one of the most riveting sections of the book was the description of a battle fought in Parliament early in the book. Were there any other examples of weapons being drawn in um in parliament um <clears throat> oh. so that uh the the incident that uh that joe's referring to there was uh, a sort of huge revolutionary um <clears throat> a kind of confrontation in and around parliament in the early days of the of the revolution when charles uh tried to regain the political initiative that he was losing to Parliament by appointing um, uh, Colonel Thomas Lunsford uh, to be uh, in control of the Tower of London. Now, the Tower of London was the fortress in the city, and it wasn't just a military fortress. It was anchoring the eastern end of the city's walls, but it also was the mint um, so it's where coinage was produced, and it was the place where merchants stored their wealth. So it was like a combination of a huge military bar barracks and the Bank of England. So if you had control of this, you had control of quite a lot. And uh, in response to this, there was a kind of wholesale uprising lasting uh, several days with mass demonstrations in Parliament. And there was actual fighting, I mean, actual sword fighting in Westminster Hall. Lilburn was uh, there, Lunsford was there. Um, they sent messages up to the City of London to bring the apprentices down. They eventually drove the Cavaliers off, and it was a very serious defeat uh, for the King. In fact, it was the event that drove him from London, and he never returned until he was put on, uh, on trial. But mass mobilisation like that uh, in and around the House of Commons was a feature of the English Revolution. Now, we're used to thinking of this, the great so-called journée, the great days of mass mobilisation in the French Revolution, but they're equally a feature of the English Revolution as well. That was the 
the Christmas mobilization around Lunsford, but then there was another huge mass mobilization in the wake of Charles trying to seize the five members, um, trying to arrest for treason uh, the five members. That produced a huge, with barges going up and down the Thames outside the Commons with artillery on it to threaten um, the king if he tried to arrest the five members again. Um, then there was a, another massive crowd that turned out for the execution of uh, the Earl of Strafford, uh, Charles's uh, main advisor, and then again and again um, over the Root and Branch uh, petition, which was an uh, attempt at massive reform of the of the church. So, he, so yes, very definitely. I, I, the scale of the mobilisations as well is fascinating, isn't it? When you think of how much smaller the population was at that point in time, we're talking really, really significant proportion of the population that was out on the streets, that was mobilised, that was taking action. It's, um, yeah, hugely significant. Um, there's, I, I've now got a couple of people with hands up. I'm going to read out one question from the chat and then come to Janet and, and to Joe. So in, in the chat, Victoria's book, here in Hull, it's often said that John Hotham shutting the gate on King Charles I in 1642 and denying him access to Hull's arsenal was the first action of the Civil War. And we're quite proud of this. Is it a fair claim? Um, yes, it, yeah, it is. Um, it, is a, it is a fair claim. That is indeed the first kind of uh, military defiance of, of, the, of the king. Um, you might have to slightly share honours with Manchester uh, because it was the attempt by um, the uh, by Lord Strange to seize the um, arsenal in Manchester, which led to the first bloodshed of the of, of the Civil War. Hotham closing the gates was bloodless. Um, mm -hmm. The defeat of uh, Lord Strange was the first casualty. Right. OK. OK. Um, Janet, you've got a question or a comment. Uh, let me sorry, let me invite you to unmute so you can uh, ask it. OK, thank you. I was just uh, I was interested in what you said about women's involvement in the level is it's not something I'd heard. And um, I wondered if were they, conf uh, you know, what was their involvement? Was it around women's issues or women's lot in life or were they participating? fully in the uh, in the organization um yeah i i i don't think it was specifically over kind of women's issues as we would understand them in modern in modern politics although uh, they would use the question of women's position in society to add kind of moral weight uh to the political demands that they were putting forward, that they were the people that had to bear the the brunt on the home front, that it was their husbands and uh, and brothers that were doing the fighting and dying and so forth and uh, and so on, and they would kind of invert uh, the notion of women as the as the as the weaker sex, as you know, kind of you know, even we can understand this. Why can't you, you moron? You know that uh, that kind of um turning of the tables with that but in but by and large they participated in the same terms as men uh women were often the 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 so-called mercuries the sellers of the of the pamphlets and broadsheets um uh they were um often uh, uh petitioners in the gathered churches uh they began to preach which was a an, abom an abomination as far as uh, most of the orthodox christians were uh were concerned so i mean what was happening really and this was happening across the board by the way because obviously a revolution of this kind and a war of this kind lasting as long as it did having the impact that it did you know proportionate to the population there were more people killed in england during the english civil war than there were in the first and second world wars put together so you can gather some kind of the disruption of the society and women were left to um, fend for themselves often. So even royalist women were conducting siege, you know, conducting defences of their castles against parliamentarian sieges. This is true of Corfe Castle. It's true of Latham House in Lancashire. 
uh, to a basing house in in the West Country. So you know, right across the society, um, it was being shaken up in a way that permitted women to do things that they would never have done before. But amongst the levellers, they were political organisers in the way that was absolutely unthinkable. Thanks, thanks. Um, Joe has uh, a hand up. Uh, Joe, I've just given you permission to unmute and then we'll come to Inga. Joe. Oh, hi there. Um, yeah, so just a, a following from my question that I sent in the chat. Um, so I don't know of any other after this this period where we went back to being a monarchy again. Um, is there any other? I I didn't know. I don't think there is any sort of um, history of invasions to Parliament by the people. Um, so I don't know if there's any. You know, you know of anything like that because it's it's quite interesting that we, we it's we have this sort of view of Parliament as being sacrosanct. But actually, they uh, they should be working for us, you know. So if they're not doing what's right, then you know there is an argument for maybe um, a bit of force, but you know, not necessarily that I support it. But is there been anything like that since? Hmm. Interesting question. I'm not sure I I know enough of detail. I don't know enough detail about what happened during Chartism, which I think would be another. Mm. Uh, another moment. Um, uh, I mean, I, I think one of the differences, though, is this: that um, the state machine is in a relatively undeveloped condition. So there's no police force. Um, there's no standing army until the new model army is created, and that's an army that's in the hands of the revolutionaries. Um, the only sort of units of armed defence that the state has got is the trained bands. You know, kind of militia, um, and they were under the control of Parliament, so they weren't going to be doing well. They were participating in the rioting um, rather than trying to prevent it. Um, so, you know, it, it's only really in the English Revolution, with the deployment of some new model army regiments to put down peace protesters, i.e., you know, moderate anti you know, pro royalists, that you you get that. In a you know in a sort of systematic arm of the state acting to defend the institutions of the state. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Um, next, I'm going to go to um, Inga, who wasn't sure how to uh, unmute. So let me just um, let me just do it from here. Inga, you should be able to click to unmute now and ask your question. Inga, you should have had an invitation to unmute yourself so that you can ask your oh, question. Right. Okie dokie, can you hear me all right? We can indeed, yes. Lovely. It's, as I say, it's a bit of a foolish question, but um, years, many years ago in a jumble, in a charity shop, I bought a little volume, which was about the size of a playing card and about the thickness of a queen cracker of John Winston Lee, it was his ideas, and I think it was to do with the diggers. I had it with me today, but I lost it somewhere. I must have left it on the bus or something. But um, I just turned to it every time. I mean, I looked at it this morning, everything that was happening in Gaza, for example, and just a few sentences seemed to sort of give me strength and calm me down. I just wonder, am I confused in thinking John Winston Lee was a leveller? Um, and have the diggers got anything to do with it? I mean, I gave up history at primary school level, so my history is a wee bit patchy. Hey, diggers, le diggers, levelers, and uh, sixteen forty-nine, John. Um, well, there's 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 no such thing as a stupid question, so um, and that certainly wasn't a bit foolish, shall we say? I feel no, a no. bit foolish because it's no, no, not at all. And uh, and you you should always buy interesting books in second-hand shops. Um, one of the reasons we know about John Lilburn is because in the 1960s, the historian Brigadier Peter Young wandered into a West Country bookshop and found the original notebook of another prisoner in the Tower of London that nobody'd seen for three wow. years. Uh, keep digging. 
Um, that's, <laughs> in that respect, yeah, yeah definitely. Respect. Uh, Gerard Winstanley. Um, oh, sorry, Gerald, yeah. Yeah, was uh, the founder of the Diggers. Now, um, some, some levellers became Diggers, um, but the Diggers themselves didn't um, originate, didn't start as a movement until after the King was executed. Um, the, the shock of the King being executed, uh, especially in a, in a highly religious society, was a kind of, you know, a millenarian bolt from the blue that, you know, the whole world had transformed, or as famously one contemporary pamphlet put it, the world had been turned upside down. Um, oh, lovely Mr. Hall, yeah, he's a goodie. I got him from a bookshop, a free bookshop as well. At Turnpike Lane Station, Christopher Hill, that yeah, world turned indeed. upside down. Yeah, and that was named after, as I say, a contemporary uh, a contemporary uh, pamphlet. And what the execution of the King did was it released a kind of massive questioning and debating about society. So you have diggers and ranters and Muggletonians and the beginning of the Quakers and on and on and on, uh, Baptist congregations. Um, uh, but the difference between the two is this. Uh, the Levellers were a mass movement which played an important part in making sure the revolution happened. The Diggers were a consequence of the revolution happening. And although in their th political thought, for instance, questioning private property, which the Levellers never did, they were more radical, uh, they were also much smaller and must, much less effectual. So what we owe the diggers is a strand of thought. What we owe the levellers is a strand of thought plus political organisation plus participation in an organised way in the revolution. Now, people, you know, sometimes, people sometimes on the left say, "Oh, would you have been a digger? Would you have been a leveller?" <laughs> the point is, we don't have to choose. We can take the political organisation and the dynamism and the participation in the revolutionary protest from the levellers. And we can take the critique of private property from the diggers. And in fact, the reason why those two things were separated in the 17th century is because there was no effective uh, working class institutions in which they could be sensibly combined. Thank you very much, John. That was absolutely bang on. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks. Thanks, John, and thanks for the question, Inga. Definitely not a foolish question. Um, with another question um, in a chat from Victoria, who says, um, earlier in the century, earlier in that century, playwrights could be very political, at least as much as the censor would allow. Were playwrights in, important during this period? Um, yeah, that's that's an interesting that's an interesting question. Um, I think I think the answer is uh, no, they weren't, I, I, or the, those plays weren't being written. And I think that's it's an interesting question about the relationship between political and revolutionary crises and the way in which um, uh, cultural movements sometimes prefigure them, but when they actually arrive have less to say when the political reality that they in some ways presaged is actually there. Now, of course, after the revolution, the reflections on the revolution, I mean, most famously, John Milton's Paradise Lost, um, were huge as well. Um, the kind of Jacobean tragedies of the early part of the of the century, which show a society in an advanced state of decay, um, were like the kind of, um, you know, the the swallow before the storm, the swallow before the summer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, do we have uh, any further questions, either from people who uh, want to raise their hand and ask them, or want to post something in the chat. Any more questions out there for John? Um, I got, 
I might throw another out myself, if that's all right, John. Um, something I, I guess I'm interested in, partly coming into the session, but it, it kind of builds on some of what people have asked about, you know, the relationships to demands then, demands today, how we, how we learn from that. Um, I'm interested, do you, what lessons do you think we can draw from the history of the levelers and indeed the diggers and others in terms of the struggles for uh, civil and democratic rights today? Because I think increasingly we live in a situation where, um, you know, the right to protest, the right to assemble, the right to uh, take form trade unions and take industrial action is increasingly under attack. Um, and there's a rich tradition to draw on here, isn't there? But I'm interested what particular lessons you'd pull out from that. Well, one of the things that struck me, and this was really the kind of organizing principle of the book, and it was something which, although there's been quite a lot of stuff written, very good stuff about the levelers. Uh, I wrote the book because this aspect of it wasn't so prominent in the history. And that is that the levelers were an organized political movement. You know, Marx called them the first communist party. Now that's a bit of a stretch, but um, you can see what he meant because they did things that we are still doing they used the petition as a way of organizing, you know, gathering support, of gathering names. They uh, advertised political demonstrations. You know, you see Level of Pound with meet today in the piazza in Covent Garden to march to Westminster. Um, they used the institutions of the day. I mean, not trade unions, there weren't any, but the mm -hmm. churches, they would, um, their, their leaflets would be stuck on church doors. They would be handed out to the congregation. Uh, they would go to the apprentices to mobilize them uh, on their uh, behalf. They produced pamphlet material to articulate their demands, petition material to articulate their demands, would lobby parliament, um, try to get a constituency, I successfully did get a constituency in the new model army when it was created. Um, so I think their organized approach to politics, they were a political organization which um, determined to make popular and mobilize popular forces for some of the most radical demands that existed inside the political spectrum at the time. And um, we're still doing that. We're still using many of those tools. Um, um, so uh, I think you can look at this period as the very first embryonic forms of political resistance, really, organized political resistance, radical political resistance. <laughs> Absolutely. And, uh, and a really interesting kind of, I guess it is, it's the challenge of of their times, but the challenge of our times as well, isn't it, to balance the, uh, not balance, in fact, quite the opposite, because it's not one or the other, but to interlink the most radical demands that are possible with uh, with mass support. Um, yeah, they, the were they were interested in the idea that you could be both radical and popular. Yeah. So, and those two things, you know, there is so much of the left, it knows very well how to be radical, but not that much about how to connect with wider <laughs> sections of the society. There's another bit on the left which knows very well how to say what it thinks is popular, but at the expense of being radical. The knack is to combine those two things, and the levelers did that very, very effectively. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> a, a couple of further comments um, in the chat here. So one, one from Joe who says, I can see parallels today with this time in the battle to control new mass information methods by authoritarian governments when comparing the printing press with the internet today, the methods of propaganda and censorship used by governments and the way mass media is utilized by opposition don't seem to have changed much over the period. And there's a, 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 a comment from Tam who says, I equate the levelers with the Benite agenda in the 1980s 
The restoration was followed by a tremendous repression here in Scotland. Where did it go wrong? Um, so again, some more kind of historical contemporary parallels, but the question, you know, ha have, have the methods of, uh, of, of, um, uh, of use of mass media, of transmitting things changed? I think some of your earlier answers suggest, John, there's a lot of continuities there, but, uh, but also, you know, when it leads to repression, what's gone wrong and, and how do we come back against that? Uh, yeah, I think um, uh, I think it's difficult um, to read what was happening with print, with pamphlets and and newspapers. I mean, this is the age of the invention of the newspaper, for instance. I mean, it wasn't just the Levellers that had newspapers; the Royalists had newspapers, the parliamentary, the other parliamentarians had newspapers. Um, <clears throat> so. It wasn't that the printing press was a new technology, you know, it was a century and more old. But it was before the English Revolution, it was controlled. It had to be agreed by the censors of the stationer's company, and the stationer's company had a, a, a royal monopoly, and unless it was licensed by the stationer's company, it couldn't be produced. Um, and that's why Lilburn was smuggling in material from right. Holland, where the presses were freer. But once the revolution starts, the censorship breaks down massively. And you can look at the graph of publications produced, and it goes higher in the 1640s. More publications, more newspapers, more pamphlets are produced um, than at any time until way into the next century. Um, so there's this massive explosion of popular uh, print, which is escaping the census. I mean, they tried to get back control of it, but they're not particularly effective in doing in doing so. Um, so yes, I think that has a parallel with the internet. And um, you know, some people think that the technology will save you, but there are certain forms of technology that are inherently beyond control. I think we've seen in the later years of the internet that nothing is inherently beyond control, um, not technically beyond control. Um, the battle to make sure it stays free is a political battle, not something that you can say just because it's an internet or just because it's a printing press, that the technique gives you freedom. The technique gives you the possibility of freedom, but mm -hmm. the political space is a political battle. Um, you know, you could always, there are always, you know, in any revolutionary experience, not just the English Revolution, the American Revolution, the French Revolution, the Spanish Civil War, the German Revolution, the Russian Revolution. Of course, there are phases of uh, advance and retreat. And sensible people learn from both. Uh, you know, I don't think that we would regard a military leader who only knew how to advance or only knew how to retreat as a very reliable form of advice. You have to learn both and the, uh, the experiences of the levelers. Um, uh, part of the admirable part of the levelers was that they learned how to fight both in advance and in retreat. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, that, that the balance of uh, being able to learn the lessons are both significant, but, but also I think uh, really important that question of technology that uh, keep reminding ourselves there aren't technological answers to political problems technology can help develop political solutions but in itself it's it's not an answer is it um inga would like to come back in um again uh inga i've just uh, invited you to unmute thank you thank you sorry to ask another make another thing so quickly um i came on to this thing this talk really apart from being really interested as I really felt I needed a bit of history, a real bit of history with um, lovely Mr. Bell um, being branded with anti-Semitism, lovely Jeremy, lovely Ken Loach. I'm a picket line artist, so I'm, it's really affecting me quite badly. And uh, I'm fairly new to activism, only just the last couple of years, really. So being thrown in at the deep end a bit. But I, I find this sort of looking back to this thread, which I've been interested in for, 
a decade, just a decade or two. I'm over 70. But um, it's really, really helpful. But um, can you think of anything, um, John, that would relate directly to what's happening at the moment with Gaza and everything else that's going on and the dreadful um, rise of almost like in the 30s, I guess. I mean, I don't know much about the rise of um, fascism at that time, but the little I do know is kind of worrying. It's a bit off topic, but and I appreciate, I understand, of course, if it's not directly related to this lecture, but the levelers seem to be, and the Cromwell stuff seems to be very relevant somehow. Oh. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's quite a reach to make this directly apply um, in those circumstances, although I dare say if we sat down and thought about it, we could come up with some, but... <clears throat> I think the way in which sort of understanding history like this works is that sometimes there are seemingly more direct uh, parallels and sometimes some of the things that they were doing takes historical imagination. It's, it's quite hard, I think, for us to, certainly in this country, to imagine what the intensity of religious debate in a gathered church was like. I mean, you wouldn't have that difficulty in Palestine, by the way, or in Iran. Um, these are theological societies where politics and religion are very closely intertwined, and they might find uh, um, parallels more immediate than we would. But those kind of things apart, I think it gives you a broad cultural sense of what the movements of classes and nations and political struggles are like. And even where it doesn't give you an exact answer to this problem or that problem today. It gives you a, a resilience and a breadth of politics, which allows you um, to um, weather difficult political situations or take advantage of um, opportunities as they arise. Um, Henry Martin, um, who we talked about a little bit in the in the talk, the MP that. Um, was the only Republican in the long parliament when it met. And he was one of the regicides, one of the people that um, signed the King's death warrant. And of course, at the restoration, he was lucky to escape with his life and was imprisoned for the rest of his life. And he wrote to his, he had a common law, um, he left his aristocratic wife and uh, married a commoner, and, uh, which was outrageous thing to do at the time uh, from somebody from his social standing and from jail um, he uh, wrote to her and he was obviously in very desperate circumstances and uh, he wrote uh, to her um, that um, the trick is not to be weather wise but weather proof in other words you can't uh, necessarily predict what the political weather would be but you have to have the reserves to be able to get through it. And I think that's what this kind of history does. Absolutely. And in many ways, that brings us back around to, to where we started the whole session. When I introduced John, I said one of the important reasons uh, for these sessions is we need to understand our own history and the history of the movement to help us shape what we do. Uh, now in the present, how we intervene in the present and how we shape the future. But obviously that's not by uh, simply drawing direct parallels and uh, trying to mechanically repeat what's happened in the past, but in fact looking at history to provide lessons and learning that enable us to be, uh, well, uh, as, as was put there, to be, to be weatherproof, to have the solutions when we face new and different situations in the future uh there's some there's some really nice comments in the chat here uh christina says just to thank john for his superb presentation delivered very well for people to understand and able to raise appropriate questions there was a good display of knowledge and i've really enjoyed the session uh, steve says um, i came in late but really enjoyed the session and feel that john has only scratched the surface and could do a series of lectures on the level as thanks a million um uh, Victoria says, thanks very much, John, really enjoyed your talk. 
um, and several people agreeing there on the idea of a series of lectures on the levelers. Uh, we will circulate material about um, about future events. Dee says, really enjoy this form of learning where I can participate. Um, Adele's raised something, said, uh, has really enjoyed it, came in a little late um, and would uh, I missed the early part of the talk. We will be sending around the recording of the entire talk to all of the, uh, everyone who signed up for this session today. So uh, you will be sent a copy of that afterwards, but we've also been live on Facebook. So I think that copy will be sent around tomorrow. If you can't wait for that, you can click onto uh, the GFTU's uh, Facebook account this evening and a few minutes after the talk, normally it should, that should appear there in full. Um, if you would like to find out more about the General Federation of Trade Unions and the work that we do, you can visit our, um, our website at gftu.org.uk or find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Um, but in particular, if you're interested in finding out more about the courses that we offer through our educational trust, if you go to gftuet, that's the General Federation of Trade Unions, educationtrust.org.uk forward slash education, we've got a full range of all the different courses uh, and events that we offer there but um all that really remains is for me to thank john very much for his contribution this evening john i don't know if you've any final words to sum up uh what you've been saying about the levelers or um or if you feel that uh that actually in answer to those questions you've got across everything you wanted to you're on you're on mute john sorry no i think uh as good a place to end is where I started with um, with Richard Rumbold. <clears throat> that no man comes into the world with a saddle on his back and no man booted and spurred to ride him. Um, that phrase traveled the world. Um, Edward Sexby, <clears throat> the agitator was sent to France when there was a Republican rising in Bordeaux, the first time the red flag was ever used as a symbol of revolt. And he translated the Levellers Agreement of the People into French. And he issued a manifesto which had that very same quotation in it. Uh, Thomas Jefferson in America, um, who was distantly related to the Lilburn family for many generations, there was always a male member of the Jefferson family uh, whose middle name was Lilburn. But Thomas Jefferson's diary um, also ends his last entry is um, that no man comes into the world with a saddle on his back and no man booted and spurred to ride him. Thanks, powerful words to end on and a reminder maybe that it's the legacy of the levelers uh, and of all those others that uh, we need to take up now, look into the future. Thanks so much, John. Uh, for your inspiring talk this evening and the answers to the question. Sam, thank you so much to all those who participated on Zoom, uh, on our Facebook Live, and uh, please do engage with the General Federation of Trade Unions with our education programme uh, and with the future sessions in this series. Our next meeting uh, will take place in another month's time where we'll be hearing from um, Ralph Darlington, who's going to be talking about the, um, the, the trade union, the labor revolts of 1910 to 1914. So we hope you'll be able to join us for that in a month's time. And thank you to everyone for joining this evening's session. Thanks very much and goodbye.